Thank you for joining today's webinar, The Business Case for Semantic Web Ontology and Knowledge Graph. My name is Thomas Cook, and I'm joined here today by Mark Wallace, who will be leading you through today's webinar. Thank you for joining. Next slide, please. Just to share a little bit about Cambridge Semantics, we were founded a little over 10 years ago. We have offices in Boston and San Diego, and our founders came out of IBM's uh, Advanced Internet Research Group doing some research in the early days of Semantic Web. And they saw, saw a need in the data management space for the ability to use graph and semantics to connect all of the silos of information across an organization uh, into a single place. And they set out to create the Anzo data fabric, our, our flagship product. Uh, they were using a lot of off-the-shelf triple store technologies for that, and many of those were having scaling issues. And they came across the company called Sparkle City, uh, which then um, later became Anzograph DB. So they joined forces, and now Anzograph DB is now an integral part of the Anzo data fabric. Today we'll be talking primarily about Anzograph DB, but stay tuned toward the end of the webinar. I'll show you a quick demo on the Anzo data fabric and how it's used to automatically create knowledge graphs and, and use ontologies. Next All right, thanks. thanks, Thomas. Um, hi, everyone. Good day. This is Mark Wallace. I'm an ontologist with Semantic Arts. Um, and Semantic Arts is a um, information um, consultancy, information technology consultancy. Um, we are experts in semantic uh, technology and ontology design. Um, we've been specializing in semantic strategy and ontology implementation at uh, many clients since 2000. Um, currently, three of the Fortune uh, 100 we have worked for. Um, we've been thought leaders in this space for a while. We speak at conferences, publish articles. We author books. There's a couple uh, of books there um, being shown. Uh, Dave McComb, our president and founder, and his latest work on the data-centric revolution. And a lot of what we talk about as we talk about the business case in this webinar um, is really gone into in detail in these books, kind of what's the problem and what's the solution. Uh, collectively, our team uh, has over 200 years of experience in this area. Um, we do invest in the ontology community beyond just semantic arts. We have a, a, a proprietary, uh, well, we have a, an ontology, just a minimalist upper on, ontology, which if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it's something we, uh, it's under the Creative Commons license. We allow uh, others to use it for free. Um, we run a GIST council for uh, governing that ontology. We also uh, are part of something called the Estes Park Group, which um, is kind of a, a think tank of a lot of um, data practitioners. Uh, we get together once a month uh, and again, um, try to move the art forward beyond just semantic arts. Um, and we also observe the International World Wide Web Consortium standards and guidelines in the work we do. So we, uh, we don't have a particular tool set that we try to sell. We use uh, best of breed and what our clients are interested in. Uh, as for me, uh, I am an ontologist, meaning I design and build ontologies uh, for clients. I've also come from a long background as a software architect and developer. I have decades of experience designing and building uh, data-centric systems. Uh, even before the semantic web, I seem to always get myself into uh, data-centric projects, data layers, things like that. I got exposed to the semantic web in about 2004, and I've been working in that area ever since. I've built some large-scale RDF applications um, up into the billions of, of, you know, triples and nodes and things like that. I've been an invited semantic web speaker since about 2009. So that's who I am. Um, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So, um, the agenda for uh, this webinar uh, is basically this. We're gonna talk about uh, kind of briefly, why are IT costs so high? Uh, what changes might be needed to solve this? We're gonna ask the question, is the semantic web knowledge graph, is that the fix possibly? Uh, we'll give you an introduction into a quick introduction to ontology and uh, for knowledge graphs. You can have a knowledge graph without an ontology. Um, we think they're better with them. We'll do some myth busting. Uh, 
after that about uh, kind of the way things were, but the way things no longer are. We hope that's helpful. And then we're going to go into some demonstrations. Uh, we'll be using Anzograph DB, and we'll demonstrate um, uh, through some Zeppelin notebooks. We will demonstrate um, some new things coming to the semantic web. There's something called RDF star, which um, we will show and we will show inference and um, we will show some graph analytics over RDF uh, style graphs um, and how that can interact with inferencing, which is something that semantic web graphs can do. And then we'll leave some time for Q&A. So um, hope uh, this will be uh, very helpful to everyone. Uh, we got a lot of wood to chop, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna start with the problem. Um, and you know, in, in the business world, the problem as we see it is that um, between 40 and 70% of most IT budgets are spent on integration. Um, this, is, uh, this particular stat comes from Dave's book, The Data Centric Revolution. And, uh, and really the reason is that um, most IT um, systems uh, have local data models and local knowledge graphs. And what I mean by that is if you think the implied scope of relational system uh, is, is supposed to be the enterprise um, uh, with the idea that a relational database might serve many applications. And that's the case in a, lot of, in a lot of cases or in some cases, but in a lot of cases we find with clients that um, the, the actual scope of relational system isn't even the enterprise. A lot of times it's just an application within the enterprise. Um, and we say the implied scope, you know, they, uh, relational databases didn't go out uh, to, to explicitly state a scope. But if you think about the way um, and identifiers and tables and things are defined, there's just real, no real mechanism for those to mean anything beyond the context of that particular application or that particular database. There's nothing built in to standard relational systems to move beyond that kind of localized view of your data. And so we end up with silos all over the place and therefore the need to integrate. Um, you know, in the last, uh, I'd say 10 years or so, we have seen the advent of uh, labeled property graphs. When you see me use LPG, that means labeled property graphs. These are graphs where you can name the edges and, and uh, give a label to the nodes to say what kind of nodes they are. Um, but here again, the implied scope of a typical labeled property graph is a single graph database. You know, you're generally working on one data set or maybe several data sets that have kind of been hand harmonized. But again, there's there's no real mechanism to reach beyond a single graph database in terms of um, sharing schema, sharing meaning, things like that. So th this uh, local problem uh, ends up creating silo after silo of data that has to be integrated, hence the, the high integration costs. And to fix this kind of local data problem, what you need is, uh, first off, you need kind of global or IDs. Like you need identifiers um, that will help you, um, that were designed to have a, a broader reach than just a local system. Something that would work um, at a broader scale, uh, at a minimum, at an enterprise scale, and perhaps even broader than that, to work with partners or even to share data around the globe or to use public data around the globe. Um, in addition to just IDs that kind of work more broadly than a local system, you need a shared schema. You know, how can I talk about a schema like customers or orders or things like that and do it in a way that everyone else is using the same schema unambiguously? And how can we make sure we know what an order means to us or a customer means to us versus a customer to someone else or across the departments in our enterprise? So um, that's another need, shared schema, clear meaning. Uh, and the other thing is we really kind of need a level of vendor uh, agnosticism because, you know, once you get to the level of enterprise, um, you're, you're not able to buy everything from just one vendor. So you kind of need something that's going to be able to work across vendors and not get you locked in. So, you know, here's a question that I pose is semantic web the fix. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that most people on the webinar have some exposure to the semantic web. Um, it's essentially a, a set of standards that allow um, data to be represented kind of in the way web pages were in the past, where they have URIs to get to them. Uh, they can be hosted anywhere in the world. And, you know, 
they can be linked together from anywhere in the world. Like I can write a web page and link to another web page on someone else's blog. So semantic web is a, is a set of standards that um, does that, but instead of just web pages, it's gonna represent kinds of things in the world, orders or people and relationships that exist in the world. Um, like a, you know, an, air, an airport is located within a city, is located within a country. So we're going from text linked to text to object representations linked to object representations. That's kind of my, my quick uh, background if you didn't know what the semantic web was. Um, and uh, so the first thing about um, the semantic web in terms of could this be uh, the fix for some of the problems we're seeing is that the explicit scope of RDF, which is the basis of the semantic web that stands for resource description framework. And it's basically the thing that makes the graph. Um, the explicit scope uh, of it is web scale. It was specifically designed for that. It does have global IDs. Uh, it uses URIs, which as we know are uh, sufficient to, uh, to fit the global web. Um, different organizations can have their domain and therefore they can control what's in that domain um, so they can keep from clobbering each other. Uh, you know, my website is different than your website. I can manage the, the URIs in that domain. And we can apply this to global IDs so that we can define data or schema uh, and be globally unique about what we mean and allow other people to use our IDs both for data and for schema. Adding to that, um, uh, since the schema is done with these global URIs, it is not only, it's shareable globally. Um, and then beyond that, um, there's, Another part of the semantic web called OWL, which is uh, ontology web language. Um, and it is a language for defining schema, known as an ontology, uh, and to do this with unambiguous meaning. So instead of just having a word for something, a term, uh, you might think of a table name or something in a database and you hope you understand what that word means. Uh, these ontologies allow you to go much deeper than just using a word you can uh, describe um, not only with textual comments and labels, but you can actually describe what it means in combination with other concepts you've modeled. And we will, I will show you an example of that uh, just a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, finally, semantic web uh, is vendor agnostic. Again, the semantic web um, is essentially a set of W3C standards. Uh, and then you know, different companies um, uh, will uh, implement against that standard. So everything would be interoperable. So you, you're vendor agnostic, you can work with multiple vendors. You can even, uh, makes it easier to change out uh, technology. If you uh, need to switch technology, your data can be uh, brought into and your queries into a different uh, vendor platform and it all still works because it's all standards based. Okay, so, um, that's why we think semantic web might be the fix. We'll be showing some examples. Um, so for the purposes of this webinar, when we kind of titled it about a uh, semantic uh, web knowledge graph, this is what I really mean. I mean a knowledge graph, so um, a data model that's made of nodes and edges, but in particular, one that is using RDF as the graph uh, technology and an OWL ontology as its schema. So that's what we mean when we talk about a semantic, a semantic knowledge graph with ontology. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what would an enterprise OWL ontology be? And this is really the, um, you know, the bread and butter of a lot of the work that semantic arts does is we go into organizations and we help them make sense of the information they have in their data systems. And part of it is just figuring out what is all this data about? And we'll go in and a lot of times our initial um, engagement will be to create something called a core ontology. We, we say think big, start small. So we think big, we're going to do a core ontology of the main concepts common to the enterprise, the ones that are central. Um, and uh, so, and then when, when we'll start small with some small pilots, but they will initially leverage that big overarching ontology so that there's room to grow in the, in the future. So um, a, an enterprise ontology defines a common core set of concepts. So these are the concepts that are central to an enterprise, you know, for a financial service uh, uh, company. You know, these might be uh, things like accounts, 
um, and transactions and um, you know customers and and so on. Um, the nice thing about this core set of concepts um, is that really it's relatively stable. You know, technology changes here and there, but the the things that are central to a financial services firm or an architectural firm or a real estate company, those things don't change all that fast. It's a relatively stable set of concepts. And also we find in our practice it's relatively small. Um, meaning we'll find there's maybe uh, a, a few hundred total concepts that the business runs on. And that may seem kind of a lot, but the alternative is what's currently happening where um, you know you have multiple databases with each of multiple tables and those tables have multiple columns. And if you think about the full set of concepts you need to understand, um, when you have, let's say, you know, we've we've had even a, a client with a small data set that we worked with, you know, they had about 700 tables and about 100 columns per table, and so that roughly is 7,700 concepts, you know, and there are some ERP implementations that literally have tens of thousands of tables and hundreds of thousands of, co of columns, and really, to, for someone to get their mind around all that information, they really have to understand tens or hundreds of thousands of concepts. So in our case, we'll get these often down to a few hundred and people can actually get their head around them and understand what things mean. So that's what I mean by it's a relatively small in comparison with all of the uh, tables and columns you would normally have to get your head around to truly understand what's going on in an enterprise. And honestly, that's why most people don't, right? It's such a mess. We have no idea. There's no real way to see all the data and all the information. And that's why integration is so difficult and costly. So uh, one thing about defining uh, an enterprise ontology like this is that um, it helps identify terminology conflicts that the enterprise has. Um, it helps synchronize the case where you might have different words for the same concept, right? Different lines of business or different people use different words when they really mean the same thing. Uh, also during this time, you'll see the opposite. You'll see the cases where the same word is being used for different concepts, that kind of uh, ambiguity. Uh, as to which one um, are you meaning. So uh, doing an enterprise ontology, uh, it takes some work. We will often spend three months uh, trying to identify a, 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 the core concepts with a, with a client. But um, then it, it pays big, big dividends because when you come up with this core set and then over time, you might want to go more deeply into a particular subdomain with a client, you'll find that um, you have a place to ground everything and everyone's talking in the same, uh, with the same set of concepts. Uh, so it really, uh, it's a little bit of work up front, but it eases integration all the way down the line. Um, the last thing I'll say about an enterprise owl ontology is um, these ontologies are formal models, meaning they actually have a mathematical basis. Um, and they, um, they, that formality means they're computable and you can actually, uh, you know, tools do automation based on these formal models. One of the things they uh, you can do is detect logical schema inconsistencies. So once you build a schema, and again, I'll show you an ontology later and you might start get a sense of how that's possible. You define some terms in terms of other terms and you you build this network of meaning. And then if, if anything is inconsistent, uh, uh, the tools can tell you. Um, also, these formal models allow you to discover new facts in the data, meaning, um, uh, you can come up with new statements that were never explicitly stated, but you can tell through the logic of what has been stated that this, uh, these other things must also be true. We'll see some cases of that. Um, just kind of a picture of what this might mean then. You kind of have this ontology model of concepts and their relationships to each other kind of in this oval. Um, and you can use that as a lens by which you can look at and often integrate uh, um, into specific kind of siloed databases and the information they contain, or maybe uh, as a way to view holistically your enterprise data lake. Uh, and uh, you can map these common central concepts down into that data and understand what you're looking at. Um, and you can even virtually or ETL them into uh, a knowledge graph and actually query it. Okay. Now I'm going to switch to kind of, uh, again, if you know, if you've heard about semantic web, um, you may have heard some of these traditional kind of pros and cons of them. 
um, you know, the, on the pro side, the, uh, they use these global URIs for linking data and reusing schema, you know, which is uh, one of the things we kind of said you need to be able to do to get out of that local memory space. Um, uh, again, they have this idea of an ontology that ensures that the schema meaning is clear. And this is, this is a, actually a bigger problem than, than many realize. Um, one of our ontologists, uh, Michael Ushold, says, you know, you cannot maintain what you do not understand. And, and a lot of times people can't possibly understand all the schemas in all of their data systems. It's just too much. Um, or the meaning is uh, ambiguous because it's just a name without any further definition. Uh, another, you know, pro of the tr traditional semantic web is that it's vendor independent. Um, you know, so that, that helps you not get locked in. But there's also, you know, some cons that people bring up about traditional semantic web knowledge graphs. One of them is, you know, they say, well, there's, there's no properties on the relationships. Um, with the advent of labeled property graphs, you can put, you can say some things about a relationship. Like, let's say you have a flight route between two airports. You can say, well, the distance on that, you know, A has route to B and the distance on that relationship is, you know, 950 miles or something. Um, in a semantic web graph, there's no properties on relationships, so this can lead to more complex models. You have to create an intermediate object called a route and point at the two ends and put a distance on that. So that's been a, a con traditionally um, that people have brought up and, and people have moved, uh, sometimes uh, feel that other labeled property graphs could be easier because they uh, allow that kind of modeling. Another knock has been, well, you can't do graph algorithms. You know, most semantic web knowledge graphs are great for queries, but um, they, they don't actually do true graph al algorithms like shortest path or page rank, things like that. <clears throat> so now we get to the myth busting part of the webinar. Um, we're gonna tell you and then we're gonna show you. Um, but this is the tell part. You know, the myth was that, okay, uh, Unfortunately now, because of these pros and cons, I have to pick. The myth is you have to pick either uh, an RDF graph or a labeled property graph. You know, if you like uh, this kind of more global data harmonization and integration and, and some of the analytics, um, you know, in terms of um, averages or statistics or things like that, computations, RDF is good for that. Um, but the labeled property graphs are good for things like graph algorithms, you know, uh, and, and edge properties. Um, and, and you got to kind of sit there and pick which one is going to work because they have not been interoperable, interoperable to date. Um, but this myth is uh, now being busted in, in the last, uh, I'd say, mm, maybe a year or so. Um, there's something uh, out there now called RDF Star, and uh, it's got a, a query language called Sparkle Star. But it is a extension of RDF that um, allows properties on the relationships. So that's one of the key things we were kind of missing in semantic graphs. I will show you some of that later. And um, the other one is um, that you don't get graph algorithms. And um, we're showing AngioGraph uh, DB and it provides graph algorithms. And I'm sure other vendors will be coming out with this soon, but uh, you know, the idea of a page rank and weighted shortest path, some of these things that were traditionally not in a typical RDF triple store, vendors like Cambridge uh, Semantics are now putting these in. So now it's kind of not an either or. I can get all the benefits of a semantic graph with global IDs, an ontological schema, um, and I can also get properties on the edges, and I can also get page rank and, and other type of graph algorithms. So. Um, and that's, uh, that's the telling. Now we're gonna move um, kind of to the showing. So um, we're gonna do uh, a demonstration using some airline data, <clears throat> flight delay data and, and such. Um, Cambridge Semantics uh, already had a data set that was doing this and using the RDF star to put uh, data on the, on the edges. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna preview that. Thomas is gonna jump on and kind of talk a little bit about the data that we that they have gotten for their uh, flight delay demo and uh, talk you through how they model that and bring that into the system. And then I'll take back over and show you how we can put ontology on top of this and inference on top of this and then get the best of both worlds, um, edges on the properties, graph analytics, as well as um, formal model inference to get answers to queries. 
so with that, Thomas, um, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so when we set out to collaborate with Semantic Arts on a joint demo for this webinar, we said, well, hey, let's reuse something that we've already done and perhaps reuse an ontology that you've already created. And, and so the airline demo, if you're not familiar, is one of our AnzoGraph getting started tutorials. And we basically took some CSV data from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. They provided uh, individual flight delay information. So we downloaded all of the flight delay data from 2003 to 2019, and that comes down in a CSV file. And we basically just loaded that data raw into the graph and uh, just kept the, all of the same predicate names. It didn't create any global IDs. Uh, just some very simple getting started tutorials. And then now what Mark will show you is how you combine that uh, with an ontology. Next slide. And so what the data looks like, there, there are a couple data sets that we're combining, but the main data is, is this flight information and it's about 32 columns. You can see those listed here. There's about 6 million records. When you, you can download these, these the data science notebooks, these Zeppelin notebooks, uh, and, and run them yourself. The data will come off of our S3 buckets. So when you load the data, when you run the notebook, it'll, it'll load the data from our S3 buckets. But this is what it looks like. Go to the next slide. So the first thing we need to do is convert those rows and columns into triples. And so we looked at the different entities that exist in there. There's, there each record is a flight. It has a, a departure of a specific airport. It also arrives at another airport. And then when a flight goes from one airport to another airport, we can also connect those with an edge. Uh, we call it a destination link. This is just a very simple model that we first got started with. Go to the next slide. Once we have that, you can start to see how the graph model starts to um, build out. And so this is kind of the standard for each record. There's, there's airports that are connected by a flight. The flight has a departure and an arrival, and we connect those with the destination link. Now, Mark will take you through how to use this ontology, but basically each one of the rest of the, go ahead, yeah, go to the next slide. Each one of the columns is associated uh, with different properties on those nodes. And here we show the RDF edge properties. I think that's a build out uh, one more. So here we have airport Boston is connected to airport JFK. We put an RDF star edge property of distance equals 187 on that edge. And that allows us to do different types of analytics like weighted shortest path. So uh, Mark will show how that's done uh, in the data science notebooks as well. Next slide. Once we have that data loaded, then we can start doing all different types of analysis. So our, our sample notebooks, the, the getting started, the first one loads the data, the second one runs these different queries so you can start analyzing it. But that's just the raw data. Now we want to start integrating that with other sources, and that's what Mark is going to take you through. So how do you do that? How do you apply an ontology uh, to that existing uh, uh, data set? And I'll hand it back over to you, Mark. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, so um, so yeah, now we're going to kind of get to the demonstration portion. So what I'd like to kind of start with, um, I'd like to start with kind of showing you a picture of of kind of the main concepts in the ontology, and then uh, I will take you from the picture into the what the ontology looks like. So um, flights are historical events in our model, as opposed to like uh, the idea of a flight or a possible future flight. Uh, flights are historical events, so they have a start time and an uh, end time. They have a route code. They have, you know, what was was there any actual delay? Things like that. Flights depart uh, from and arrive at airports. Um, airports can have routes to other airports, as um, Thomas kind of just mentioned, and they can have uh, these routes can have distances, so we can model that. Um, you know, airports are a type of place in the general sense. Airports is just one of many types of places. Um, geographic regions, such as cities, states, and countries are places too. So, you know, this model is just showing showing that. Um, there's lots of different kinds of places, some being regions, some not, some being landmarks or other things. 
Uh, it's important to note that places can be located within other places. You know, that makes common sense to us as humans. We understand that, you know, if I'm located in Melbourne, Florida, and Melbourne, Florida is located in Brevard County, and Brevard County is located in Florida, then I'm also located in Florida and the United States, et cetera. So this is something we can put in our ontology, the idea that uh, places can be located in places. We can also even define that located in is something called a transitive property. Meaning, like I said, if A is located in B and B is located in C, then the system, if we say that located in is a transitive relationship, the system can infer that A is located in C and on up the chain. And that actually will play into uh, some of the stuff we show you in a minute with the flight demo. Um, so yeah, so just an example again, places, so airport can be located in a city, the city can be located in a state, state in a country, et cetera. So this is kind of the overall model um, that kind of pictorially will have uh, flights uh, and, and places, uh, airports they arrive and depart from. Um, we will get into uh, a little bit later the idea that we're going to subclassify and be able to determine what's an international flight and an international, uh, sorry, international arrivals and departures, right? So a subtype of flight, those that uh, come in from somewhere that's not the current domestic country and some that are leaving from a domestic country to a foreign country uh, based on a, a certain perspective. Um, so in terms of the data that we're building from, uh, we actually end up with two uh, different data dumps that we used. One was the flight uh, data, uh, one with delays that Thomas mentioned. Another one is an airport set of airport data that just tells what airports are located in what you know cities and countries and what their lat longs are and things like that, what their uh, codes are. Um, so we'll end up building data that looks kind of like this. We'll have you know airport uh, located in a city, city located in a country, uh, other airports linked to, um, again, up through cities and countries and airports and their routes to each other with uh, distances on the edges. And then uh, we also have that flight data. So there'll be a particular flight. Uh, we'll get into kind of the URIs that model these things. Actually, as I hover, you can kind of see that. Um, because we're using an RDF graph, every one of these things is really modeled with a URI that makes them distinctive and uh, globally shareable. Uh, uh, and other people that want to talk about the same uh, Orlando airport could do so by using the same URI. And essentially, so then we'll talk about flights, particular flights that had an arrival and a departure time and maybe a delay and they, where they departed from where they arrived at. This is the type of data we'll be building. Um, okay, so that's just a picture. And I now wanna show you uh, an ontology. So let me show you uh, what an ontology kind of looks like. There's a language for this called OWL. Ultimately, this is, there's a, It'd be like software, there's like a, a software text file, um, or you can also store them in a triple store. But ontology, um, this model, we can, uh, interestingly, we even can name, we name the ontology with a URI to make that a universal ID. We can give it a universal, we can give it a version number. We can annotate the ontology, say a few things about what it is, who created it, et cetera. Um, and then, the ontology really uh, allows us to define classes or types of things and, and relationships between them. So for example, in the simple flight ontology that we were using, um, we use this as part of a training course that we do. It's a you know, kind of a small ontology, but it shows the key concepts. And when we understood or we found out that um, Cambridge already had a flight demo, we thought we'd go ahead and, and utilize it. So uh, again, as you can see, the ontology, all of these items in here have a URI that defines them. Uh, we've defined a concept called a flight, you know, at the highest level, organization and place. Um, this sort of tree diagram shows kind of concepts defined from general to specific. So the most general concepts are at the top of the tree. And as you work your way down, you know, things get more specific. So for example, an airport is a kind of place uh, we can describe every uh, every item, you know, with what we call a preferred label um, and a, a textual definition. Uh, the classes are the types of things. So we can say an airport's a type of place, a geographic region, 
is a type of place. And then we can go further. A city is a type of geographic region. A country is a type of geographic region, a state. Uh, and again, we can define all these. Um, and where this, I think where this kind of gets particularly interesting um, is uh, how the definitions get formal. Uh, I'm gonna show you that in just a second. Let me show you just a couple more things about the annotations. Um, I mentioned that vocabularies can, vocabularies can be globally shared, schema can be shared. Um, there's some of that happening right here with uh, SCOS, uh, which is an organization put out a vocabulary called SCOS, which is Simple Knowledge Organization System. And they had this neat idea that you might have a preferred label for something and then alternate labels for something. We mentioned, you know, what if your name isn't quite right and people have a hard time understanding it? Uh, so we utilize their vocabulary to say, well, this is what we're going to call it. But we want to, for searching or just for people's understanding, we want to allow you to, to say there's also alternative labels for these things. You can also do these multilingually so that your data can be understandable in any language. Um, you can have multiple labels, one in English, one in Spanish, you know, one in German, et cetera. Um, in addition to the types of objects we're going to have, that's really these classes are the types of objects in our world. Um, you also can have um, properties. This is a set of object properties in this vocabulary, and essentially it's the kind of relationships that will occur between things. So arrives at, departs from, has route to, located in, we've mentioned these sort of things. Again, all documented. Um, data properties are really the way, you know, this is a way to connect uh, objects to objects. Data properties are the way to connect values. It's just, uh, I want to put a value um, on some object like uh, its name or uh, the date that it started or the date that it ended or distance in miles. Um, another cool thing about ontologies is that you can, uh, properties, in addition to classes, properties can be hierarchical. So here's a case of the concept of a delay, an amount of time in minutes when something was between, when something you know was planned to occur to when it actually occurs. And that's the general concept of a delay, but actually in the flight area, we might wanna talk about distinguishing the more specific arrival delays versus departure delays. So we can actually say, well, an arrival delay is a delay, but it's a little more specific. This is the amount of time for when an arrival was planned to occur to when it actually occurred. So that's kind of um, the ontological concepts. Now here's where it gets uh, more formal. I'm just gonna try to walk quickly through uh, one definition here, an international arrival. So from where it is, we can, we've defining this in terms of other terms. We're saying a flight or an international arrival is what? Well, it's a flight, but it's a, specifically a flight that arrives at a domestic airport and departs from a foreign airport. Okay, well, you know, what is a, a foreign airport? Well, a foreign airport is an airport and a foreign location, something that's simultaneously an airport or a foreign location. Well, what does a foreign location mean? Well, foreign location is any place that is located in a foreign country. Well, what's a foreign country? Well, a foreign country is any country that is not in the set of domestic countries. And from this perspective of doing this for a client in the United States, what's a, what's a domestic country? Well, it's a country that is this particular one. So actually that, that, that kind of shows you how you can define elements of the uh, or concepts in your ontology in terms of other ones and you get that, that really specific meaning. Like um, I now understand you know, uh, when someone just says a domestic airport or an international arrival, I don't have to guess at what that means. I can actually step all the way through the formal definition and understand how they're defining that. Um, and uh, this sort of stuff, uh, allows us to infer you know, new, new facts. And we'll see that in the demo, and I'm gonna jump to that now. So uh, let us now go to uh, this is a Zeppelin notebook. It's like a data science notebook. Uh, it's connected, in this case, it's connected to a AnzoGraph DB backend. And this notebook, as Thomas said, will be made available. So anyone who wants to work through it can. So this is, um, we're going to actually get, get going here. Um, first off, I'm going to kind of reset the world. So we're going to actually do this live. This is basically just dropping all the previous data that was there. Um, I should mention uh, uh, there are Docker containers um, 
I, I believe, Thomas, these can be downloaded as well. I'm not sure, but if not, there's there's ways that you all can can get a copy of, uh, That's of, the, of the, yeah, is that right? They can download a Docker container just like, just like I did. Okay, so the, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load the ontology. So I showed you that ontology in this uh, protege tool, which is a free tool. This is the actual code of an ontology. I'll just look that you look at this real fast. You define different properties. You define your classes. Everything you saw in there, the pref labels, the definitions, the data properties, and the classes, including their kind of complex uh, definitions, all in this file. And this file's not too big. It's about 400 lines or so. I'm going to take this ontology and actually kind of put it into AnzographDB just by running this. Okay, it's in there. Uh, next up, we're gonna load the US flight delay um, CSV files. Uh, we're gonna align this data to the ontology as we bring it in, meaning we're gonna use vocabulary terms in the flight ontology as we load it. Um, you know, By using the ontology's vocabulary, we'll also get its formal meanings. So we'll get the idea that uh, you know, certain properties like location or transitive, et cetera. Um, you may also notice that there's some concepts in the data that we're gonna go, gonna go ahead and load, like maybe wheels off time or taxi in time that we actually don't have, Semantic Arts didn't have in its original ontology. And that's okay. That's one of the cool things about these graphs is um, you can have other things that aren't in someone's ontology you try to use. We're just gonna use a different namespace for those items and you'll see that. So here we go. Um, AnzoGraph uh, basically um, does a slight, uh, they allow you to use, this is standard um, Sparkle update syntax. The same, we're gonna insert into a graph and we're gonna start building a graph. We're gonna have airline URIs. And we're gonna say something is, an, is a flight carrier. It's got a pref label. We're gonna build um, airports, say something is an airport, what its terminal code is. Uh, Here's this part where we get into this thing called RDF star, which I can't go into a lot, but the idea of an edge property, we're gonna build an edge from an origin airport to a destination airport. We're gonna build a triple that looks like this. And then we're gonna say, hey, for that edge with this special syntax of double angle bracket, that edge between those specific airports has a particular distance in miles. Uh, we're gonna build flight data, who operates it, et cetera. Um, and this is where, as Thomas mentioned, we're going to go grab this a CSV file off of an S3 bucket. We're going to do a little bit of data manipulation on the way in. We're going to build, since we need to build these URIs to allow things to be shared, we're going to build URIs. I won't get into the details, but using standard Sparkle, which is the uh, language of the, the query language of the semantic web and the data building language, we will do that. And then essentially, um, we'll, as you see, we'll be using the flight terms for a lot of this data as we build it. So let me go ahead and do that. Okay, and it's bringing that data in. I had a little query at the end that says we pulled in about 10,000 records. Uh, we're gonna do a, another one, a, a bring in another data set. This is the one that was airports and cities and countries and things like that. Again, we're gonna be building uh, airport, IR, uh, defining airports and their labels, you know, their terminal codes. And this data talked about the city and country. We're gonna be, uh, we call this at Semantic Arts, we call this minting URIs. Um, you know, uh, the URI is so powerful, you do gotta put in a little bit of work to get that power. And that really is thinking hard about how you want to name things or how you want to give them an ID. And just like you mint a coin, we talk about minting URIs. And as we bring this data in, we're gonna be careful that the airport URIs that we mint here are minted in the same way as we minted them as we were doing the flight data, talking about to and from airports. And by using the same ID, those things will just snap together in the graph. Essentially, we'll get integration for free by doing some thinking about how we want our URIs uh, to look. Okay, I'm gonna run this one. Okay, and we got 6,000 or so airports. So um, now we're gonna do some, some queries. Um, so this first one, this is a Sparkle Star query. Um, this is part of uh, essentially um, Cambridge Semantics original demo. 
It's just saying, I just want to uh, find um, the longest routes in general. So we see the same syntax, this RDF star sparkle star syntax. This is a query that basically says, go find me from or, uh, things that go from an origin airport to a destination airport and grab the edge distance off of that edge uh, and go ahead and we're gonna order by descending uh, distance. So we're essentially gonna find the, uh, the longest ones first. Uh, notice we're just looking for airports. And so essentially we, uh, we did a little trick in here where we can build new variables and we simply took the airport codes and said, okay, Honolulu to JFK, that's the longest, et cetera. So here's some analytics we're doing on the graph using edge properties. So that's already a, a cool addition to standard RDF where you would have had to create a separate object to represent distance between two things. We can put that right on the edge. Um, another query that came out of the original, um, you know, the, the basic ANSA graph capability is this idea of um, page rank. So what are the most well-connected airports based on page rank? So there's a syntax by which uh, we use something called a service call, which is a standard part of Sparkle. And we're essentially gonna try to find things that go from, um, uh, we're gonna look at all the links coming uh, into or out of an airport and figure out which airports have the most links coming to them meaning they seem to be the most well-connected. This is a graph analytics um, capability, not something that you typically can do uh, in a typical Sparkle query. Uh, and it uh, computes a, a page rank value, and we can see Chicago is the highest, uh, the most highly interconnected airport, followed shortly by Dallas-Fort Worth. Okay, so we've already seen um, just on the straight graph this uh, edge property computations, as well as page rank graph analytics. Two of the things we said, you know, this is part of that myth busting, that now there are systems that can do those sort of things with a semantic graph. Uh, but what we're kind of uh, now something a little bit new that we haven't seen in the previous uh, Cambridge uh, demos is we're gonna go ahead and use the ontology that we brought in and its axioms uh, and we're gonna run what's called a reasoner. The answer graph DB has a reasoner. It'll generate new triple store statements, new statements, new connections in the graph based on the logic that's in the ontology's definitions combined with the data that we loaded. So for example, this will infer uh, located in transitivity. So if we said uh, McCoy Airport was located in Orlando, but we didn't say McCoy Airport was located in the United States. But we also, but we did tell the system that Orlando was located in the United States. And so what's gonna happen is that located in transitivity, it's gonna be able to infer the new fact that, oh, okay, there's a whole bunch of airports that I now know are in the US uh, directly. I'm gonna assert that direct link um, logically. It will infer what places, cities and airports could be considered domestic locations and, and foreign locations based on whether they have a located in transitivity to a foreign country or domestic country. That's new information. It wasn't explicitly stated. You know, if you had a database, uh, it's not just going to figure that out, but these uh, semantic models will figure it out. And I, I like to think of them as they're pretty intuitive. They do kind of what we humans do without us thinking about it. You know, if I know that uh, an airport is in Orlando, uh, then I know it's in the United States, but a, a database doesn't know that. But with an ontology plus a graph like this and a semantic graph, the, the, the graph will figure it out through inference. Finally, uh, and it's interesting because these chain on each other. So uh, given this chaining, given those inferences, it will further determine which flights are international arrivals and international departures. We will have never declared any flight to be an international departure. We're just gonna have said, you know, the data just said it started at this airport and ended at this airport. And the data simply said, you know, this airport's located in this city. So inference is now gonna give us a lot more information. Um, so let me go ahead and I'll show you uh, Anzo graph just has a command, create inferences. And we're gonna create inferences from, this is basically, I haven't mentioned this yet, but we put all this data in something called a named graph. It's just a, a named bucket to put uh, statements in. When we generate all this new information, all the things that the system can infer, we're gonna put those in a slightly different named graph just to kind of keep them separate. Uh, there's different rules options. We're just gonna run with all the inference rules. 
and um, this is out there computing the inferences. It's gone ahead and done it. And so now we're going to ask um, a question that's actually very much based on inference. Uh, which flights are international departures? So instead of looking for something that's a flight, our query now looks for something that is an international departure. And if you recall, we never said anything was an international departure. We just said things were flights and where they came from. So the inference, the only way to answer this query is that the inference will have figured out which things are international departures. So let me run that. So there we go. So this is a combination of now this data uh, has been uh, reasoned over. And now, um, additionally, flights have been additionally classified as to whether they're international departures or arrivals. Uh, cities have been uh, reclassified or additionally classified as to whether they're domestic or foreign cities, et cetera. And all that comes together uh, here. Um, that was departures. This is just a similar query looking for international arrivals. So we have things uh, departing from an international arrival, something that departed from a foreign country, again, relative to our US client and our landing in a uh, US, uh, a foreign city and landing in a US city. Okay, now I've been showing you some kind of pretty pictures because we do have these things like labels we can put on the objects, but I just wanted to show you, you know, what does this data really look like? Um, it turns out, because I've been talking about these URIs, this is what the data really looks like. You know, you have a URI representing the carrier, a URI representing the flight with a unique ID so they don't collide except where you want them to link up together. Uh, you know, the departure airport is really a URI, the arrival airport's a URI. We're just able to hang labels and other things off them to make them, you know, pretty when we display the queries for a typical user. Um, but it's all URIs under the hood. Um, I have a quick query here just to see how many countries were represented in our flight data. Um, so we're just saying, you know, find everything that's a country. Uh, we've got 238 countries represented in this data. Uh, how many statements are in our graphs? Um, in the data we've loaded, we ended up with uh, almost 400,000 uh, essentially um, edges. Um, in our, uh, our statements in our basic flight and city network. And then when we ran that inference, we got another 200,000 facts that were added based on the logic and the ontology and the data that we had. So now we're gonna do something kind of cool that brings it all together. If anyone's still out there and following, um, we're gonna figure out the longest routes from foreign airports. So this is, you know, we, we had done a, a longest routes before, which was a, a page rank, uh, not a page rank, a distance calculation on the edges. Um, but this one is going to combine that edge calculation with inference determining as whether an airport was foreign or not. Um, remember, foreignness of airports is inferred. The data never said anything about that. The data only marks countries. Uh, you know, we mark the countries uh, for our client as the USA will be the domestic country. Everything else will be foreign. The system will infer the airports to be foreign um, based on whether they're located in a city that's located in a foreign country. So this is really showing the combination of inference and edge properties in the same query. Um, so you'll see, and, and the, where the inference fits in here is simply that we never declared anything to be a foreign airport. But now in our query, we can say, only give me foreign airports that have routes to uh, other airports. And it was the inference that added all those statements determining whether an airport was foreign or not. And again, so we're using the results of inference plus the edge properties to compute the longest distance uh, routes that involve foreign airports. And here they are. Okay, pretty cool. We're combining uh, inference and edge properties in a semantic web graph. Very nice. And then this is kind of the, the last little bit. We're going to use um, that page rank algorithm again, but again, we're going to filter down only to foreign airports, which is not something that was originally in the data, but inference brought us. So this shows a combination of inference plus a graph algorithm in a single query. So again, you see us using uh, nodes that are foreign airports, that was inferred, uh, page rank being run, and we will run that. And these are the most well-connected foreign airports in our data. Uh, San Juan at the top, uh, St. Thomas coming in next. 
Um, so that's uh, in a nutshell. I know that was pretty fast, but I hope uh, we got through it all and I hope it made sense to you. You'll have time to uh, download the notebooks and play around with it a lot uh, yourself, hopefully. So uh, at this point, I wanna kind of switch back to um, and let kind of Thomas take things. In fact, Thomas, you might wanna pick up the presentation yeah. on your side. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. This is a great example of uh, how to use a combination of inferencing combined with the ontology uh, and analytics and RDF. So a wonderful example of how all that can be combined and, and people can download the notebook and, and try it themselves. So uh, I wanted to take you guys through a little bit about Anzograph before the top of the hour. Um, the, the recording of this webinar will be available. We'll send that out. But Today we were looking at Anzograph DB in the Zeppelin notebooks um, um, that Mark was showing. And what makes Anzograph so special is our ability to scale and our performance. So we have linear horizontal scaling, which means that you can add as many nodes to a cluster to handle any amount of data, which is very unique for RDF triple stores. Not many out there are, are able to scale uh, in this way. And what we mean by linear horizontal scaling is that as your data volumes grow, you can simply add more nodes and you will get the same performance. So uh, we published some benchmarks where we have um, where we have some queries running on a single node. We scaled that data up to 40x the data and we ran the same on 40 servers as well. And, and, and the queries run in about the same time. And so that proves the, the linear scaling of Anzograph. So we can handle any data volume we're an in-memory database, uh, distributed MPP processing, both for loading and querying, so you get amazing performance. We're designed from the ground up for analytical processing. So high performance analytical processing, we've built all kinds of different analytical functions from data warehouse style functions, graph algorithms, um, over 50 different data science functions, uh, also recently added geospatial support, as well as data virtualization. And we're built entirely upon standards. So that is Anzograph DB. It's available for free download, uh, up to 16 gigabytes of processing. And you can download these sample notebooks and, and try it yourself. And I'll hand it back to Mark uh, to, to recap. And I also have a, a quick few minutes I want to show you of the Anzo data fabric uh, at the end to show you how you can leverage ontologies in our Anzo data fabric to build a knowledge graph. Mark? Yep, thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, so just to recap, you know, we kind of talked about why our IT costs so high, you know, so much of it is integration, what changes were needed to solve it. You know, we kind of needed a more global way of looking at things, of doing schema and IDs. We looked at semantic web knowledge graphs as possibly the fix. Um, kind of took you quickly through um, the breakneck speed of an ontology and what you can do with it and how you define terms uh, in, in terms of other things and, and get them more concrete meaning as opposed to just, you know, names of things. Did some myth busting about uh, kind of the either or dilemma that we've faced pretty much to date uh, between semantic web knowledge graphs and other labeled property graph implementations that um, the, that are falling away, that that's no longer the case. There are uh, ways now to combine them all. Uh, and then we uh, hopefully demonstrated that convincingly with um, you know a, a small problem set uh, that brought in data and was able to show the combination of graph algorithms, edge properties, uh, and ontological inferencing. So uh, we hope that was helpful to you. And uh, Thomas, you can wrap it up. Yeah, thank you so much. And last, I wanted to show you the Anzo Data Fabric, which is a platform designed to automatically create knowledge graphs, uh, import ontologies, and connect different data sources together. Um, this allows you to quickly accelerate these types of uh, these types of projects. So, what we were looking at, Anzo Graph DB, is more of a developer tool and developer interface where you type in a lot of code. Uh, to be able to accomplish what you're doing, whereas Anzo is more of a graphical user interface. So you can see here, these are several different data sets that are connected together. Uh, these are publicly available uh, drug product data sets, and you can see how the different colors represent different data sources. And so that's what we're seeing, how those different data sources link together here. And you can see the ontology and how everything is connected inside of the Anzo data fabric. 
It also provides you several tools over here on the left to onboard different data sources. So we can onboard structured data from virtually any data source, unstructured data, uh, build out data dictionaries. You can model that and then blend that together, transform it, cleanse it, et cetera, create um, curated analytics ready data sets for downstream access. Uh, and that's the final step is access. So you can do different BI, uh, build different BI dashboards inside of here or make the, make the data available through OData or JDBC connections uh, to downstream uh, processing tools. So that's a little bit about the Anzo Data Fabric. If you're interested in that, uh, please contact us or feel free to download Anzo Graph and give it a shot today. We really appreciate everyone's time and attention. And uh, I know we ran out of time for questions. We'll follow up via email for the questions. Uh, but I uh, hope everybody has a great day and thank you for joining our webinar.